Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The lecture 26, uh, we are going to begin with a review of uh, the ADI method that we have discussed so far and talk about the choice of acceleration parameters, namely those Piesman, Rashford and Wachspress methods. We will uh, talk about gersh gorin's theorem that at identifies various disks where the eigenvalues reside and once we know the eigenspectrum, we can uh, find out this. Uh, uh, acceleration parameters and uh, in a further uh, expansion of the idea of ADI method, we point out that this is essentially an additive uh, splitting uh, and works only for two dimension. When we go to three dimensional problem, we do not have the ability to use the ADI method and then also we also we find that on many tough problems, ADI methods uh, do not work. And we move to a new class of method which are called the multigrid method. Essentially, the idea here is to work on a set of uh, grids, not necessarily on one grid like what we have done so far. And in the context of multigrid method, we can fall back upon the classical iteration as the constituent of this multigrid method, and that is why we reinterpret the classic uh, iterative method in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenspectrum. And as an example, we begin uh, with uh, discussion with uh, two grid method. That is essentially we are talking about one coarse grid and one fine grid and introduce the various operators that are involved in uh, solving multi grid method. Namely, uh, some of them are mentioned here restriction operator and the injection operators. We uh, did talk about uh, uh, how operational it is done. You do not need to uh, look at all the eigenvalues to reduce the error. What you do instead, you strategically position some uh, acceleration parameters between the minimum and maximum A bar and B bar and uh, then this uh, number of such uh, strategically positioned uh, acceleration parameters are obtained either by Varga's suggestion or the one that is uh, given by Voxpress. And uh, we uh, presume that these parameters would provide us with a very high rate of convergence. And we did talk about a, a theorem which uh, happens to be a very handy tool in uh, finding out uh, the maximum and minimum of eigenvalue of any matrix and that is due to gersh gorin And we actually use that gersh gorin theorem 1 to obtain the disks uh, which are nothing but uh, symptomatic of uh, the entries of the rows or columns of that matrix A. And what you do is that the disk has a center uh, which is given by the diagonal element and the radius of the disk is given by the, the sum of the modulus of all the off diagonal term in that row or column. And you assemble all this disk that gives you the kind of a idea of the spread of eigenvalues of that matrix. Okay? So, this is uh, how <coughs> one does and uh, going with the theme of uh, iterative solution of uh, um, elliptic PD, suppose uh, we are uh, trying to solve and suppose say uh, for the sake of understanding, uh, assume that uh, we are working on a Cartesian frame and uh, we have let us say uh, non-dimensionalized the problem in such a way that we can take the range of x and y from 0 to pi. Okay. If we do that, then uh, error vector could be written in terms of uh, the eigenfunctions uh, taken from the Fourier modes that sin uh, i is the x direction node number, j is the y direction node number and the amplitude is given in terms of capital E with a superscript n inside the bracket. Then uh, you realize that uh, the step uh, we followed in ADI method 
involved uh, taking the solution at uh, nth level and then just simply uh, solving it in the with the h parameter and that would uh, take us the solution to the half step n plus half <coughs> and uh, this uh, u t term would be nothing but then u n plus half minus u n by delta t by 2. So, what we can do is uh, we can uh, really uh, substitute uh, 72 uh, in this equation. Okay? So, basically uh, if you do that uh, what you are going to get for example, if I write this down that would be uh, as given by 72, I would write it as uh, E uh, sub uh, superscript of n plus half that is the amplitude and when I am uh, doing the x derivative operation, the y uh, dependent part remains same. So, this part uh, sin pi j q k would uh, remain same. So, k is basically delta y. So, k is delta y and uh, h is uh, delta x and so uh, if I now write this, so this is essentially the operator is uh, we know it is something like u i plus 1 minus 2 u i plus uh, u i minus 1. So, this is the form of, form of the uh, function. So, that basically uh, would Find out that will be simply en plus half minus en 
like this. And uh, you can open it up and uh, simplify it. This is what you are going to get. Okay? So from here, uh, we, uh, of course, uh, I have uh, not written down that part. I have written it with h squared. So uh, this is with the square I written. So I have just taken that. But it's divided by, right? So this is uh, divided by h squared. So I'm just simply looking at like this. h squared into this, and k squared into this, and then substitute in uh, this equation. Simplify. This is what you're looking at. So basically, um, r1 and r2 are something like our Peclé number in the x and y direction, right? That's what you are seeing. That r1 is the Peclé number in the x direction, r2 is the Peclé number in the y direction. And you find that the amplitude by which uh, the amplitude changes in the half step is given by this factor. 1 minus 2 r2 times square pi qk by 2 divided by 1 plus uh, 2 r1 times uh, sine square pi h by 2. Now, <coughs> this has a form of this kind, right? 1 minus h square divided by 1 minus 1 plus b square. And uh, since a and b are very similar, so there is uh, no way you can uh, make any observation about the value here, right? It could be less than 1, it could be greater than 1, it could be anything, right? This factor that we have written here, it could be anything. However, uh, in the next half step, we would be uh, doing uh, something like this, delta x square u and j. Uh, we will take it as a previous step, but now we are going to do the next half step that will be taking us uh, to the end of the step. So that's what we are going to get. And this side will get uh, u i j uh, n plus 1 <coughs> minus u i j n. And that will be divided by the factor by 2. Okay? So that's the second half step that uh, we have not written down, but that is implied. And you go through the same kind of uh, substitution of the error vector that you have provided here and uh, do the calculation. And you would see that the amplitude ratio in this half step uh, works out to be uh, almost identical in uh, nature. It looks like 1 minus b squared divided by 1 plus s squared. So, overall, actually, the uh, total step would take you from en to en plus 1, so you just simply multiply these two factors and you get this. This is exactly like what we said about the similarity transformation that eigenvalue does not change and in the end what you get that individually these factors are not guaranteed to be less than 1, but the compound step, the product of the two, uh, gives you these factors, right? 1 minus s squared divided by 1 plus s squared and the second is similar to 1 minus s squared. Uh, so basically, um, this is what we uh, actually uh, conclude that uh, in ADI, what we are doing that individually the steps could be unstable, like what we just now explained. However, when we put them together, we get a stable algorithm. Right? So that's that's the key to success of ADI method. Now, uh, this was possible because we are looking at a two-dimensional trauma and the operator that we had, we could split it additively and we could uh, do those things. So, symmetrically, the error cancelled out to give us a stable method. Um, for 3D problem, uh, we uh, really can't have the same luxury of straightforward applying this uh, procedure. We may have to do a little additional manipulation. Uh, so, additive splitting does not really work out uh, as easily as it was for 2D. <coughs> that is uh, one thing that we observe about ADI. And there is another thing that you have noticed that uh, when we worked with uh, ADI vector, we chose those uh, acceleration parameters. And once we chose uh, those acceleration parameters, we stayed with it in the same grid. Right? We kept on working with the same grid, but we kept on changing the acceleration parameter to reduce the error. Now, there is a uh, parallel work that was done uh, in Russia in the late 50s uh, by a mathematician named Federico. 
Federico actually um, is smart enough to notice that uh, when we are doing all this uh, I mean, iterations, like if you recall, we worked out all those expressions for G1, G2, G3, G4, G5. What did we find? That as we went along, it became progressively worse and worse. And in the fifth step, actually, the ratio had overshot by one, right? So, Petrenko's observation was that if we keep uh, doing any kind of uh, iterative operation, what happens is the first few steps are pretty much optimistic step. It uh, reduces the error very rapidly. Then it stops. Why does it stop? If you now connect that point DI method, you would see that as you went along, you kept on working on different eigenvalues. And your iteration number increases means your eigenvalues are going up in the list. So what happens? Initially, you work with the error, which have much larger wavelength. They are controlled easily. G2 also is the next harmonic, and G3 will give you the next harmonic, and so on and so forth. But, but by the time you have come to the fifth harmonic, things have started misbehaving. That is exactly what we noticed. So uh, the idea was that uh, it's probably then not worthwhile to keep on struggling with the same <coughs> method, which we know is doomed to not yield any good dividend, right? It is going to get worse and worse. So how do we improve it? So his observation was that uh, the error, those which are uh, reduced, had some relationship with the size of the domain and the way we discretize. <coughs> those errors, which are of the size of the domain, they decrease faster. That's what we saw in G1, G2, etc. But the moment we kept on going into higher harmonics, there it was no more good. So this uh, was uh, noted very smartly by Federico, and he suggested what is now called as multigrade method. Now, I have uh, often told you about uh, this uh, word. I probably never wrote it down. Eponymy. You know, when somebody does the work, somebody gets the credit. Petrenko did it and wrote it in his thesis. Nobody knew about it. Then there was the smart American mathematician, Arthur Brandt. He comes out in the 80s. He notices all this. He gets a similar idea. Um, he says, OK, we have a new method called multigrid method. So in the multigrid method, the idea is the following. That's what we are trying to show you by an example. Let's say we are trying to solve it trivial problem. Um, of course, we can analytically solve it, right? But I'm just uh, using it just to demonstrate how it uh, works. What you do is, suppose I have to solve this uh, ODE, a one-dimensional problem, uh, in a small uh, in a domain, one-dimensional domain, this is 0, 1. And uh, let's say we have the condition provided at the end of the domain. Then, what we do is, we keep on working on different types of grids. Because every time I work on a particular grid, I know which are the error components which are going to be damped. So the moment I exhaust that possibility, I go to a different grid. And there I start working on a different wavelength of uh, error component, right? What is advantageous in this sense? It is advantageous in the sense that if I am working on a coarser grid, of course I'm doing less work, lesser number of points. But the moment I uh, uh, decide to write in a ADI, I kept on uh, working on the finest possible grid, right? But this is where the distinction came in multi-grid method. That you may start off with a fine grid, but then you can keep on migrating to coarser and coarser grid. And then you can go through this process in a sequence, right? In an iterative sequence. Every time you exhaust the possibility of error being reduced in that particular grid, you go to the other grid. That's where the name multi grid comes from, okay? You work with multiple grids. So, of course, so you know, Bonimi is the story. Yeah. I drink with the work, but uh, 
it flourished in the 80s with a lot of effort from Marty Brown and many other uh, mathematicians all over the world. So, what we do actually, let's say we have the domains between 0 and 1. So, the least possible uh, discretization that you could do is this, right? Having one point in the middle. So, then the spacing is 1 by 2. I think that is a mistake. This should be H1. So, this is our initial grid, H0 is half, right? The spacing is half and half. Then we uh, reduce the spacing by uh, factor of 2. And then I get the spacing will be 1 fourth. Then I go to the third one, that will be 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, and so on and so forth. So this is the way. Uh, there is a typing mistake. So this should be H1, H2, H3. So we take the sequence of grids such that the spacing has this hierarchy. And the number of points, of course, uh, have been uh, taken uh, to be given by HL. It's, let's say, LF level grid we are looking at. The number of points is uh, given by 2 to the power L plus 1 plus 1, right? That's what we are getting, right? H0, H1. You can see that. And then, of course, the spacing is 1 over 2 to the power L plus 1. So at any LF level, uh, we can talk about a grid given by the set. Uh, we'll write it as uh, omega L uh, would be nothing but the new time feature. New is the counter of the part. So if I have the spacing as HL, I will have uh, HL, 2 HL, 3 HL, all the way up to NL minus 1 into HL. Okay? So this is the idea. Now let's understand why uh, we need to work on multiple grids. So what I uh, do is I just simply discretize that equation that we started off in solving. So what we get is this thing is second derivative of u with respect to s, you write it like this. Now if I define uh, this, uh, the grids at the LF level, let's say we are working on the LF grid, so that's why we are uh, using the subscript L here, uh, as is the forcing function L, then this is the discrete equation, right? Uh, good purpose, we chose it because it's easy to follow, it gives you a tridiagonal matrix, with a strictly diagonal dominant property, and uh, what we uh, do is try to understand uh, what it is. So basically the discrete equation that we uh, would have would be something linear operator operating on the u at the LF uh, grid level uh, forced by this forcing term as well. And then if I write, if I look at uh, any one line in this uh, discrete uh, equation, so if I uh, write the corresponding eigenvectors of g, so this is nothing but uh, minus g. So the, the diagonal term will be gm, so, so 2gm, and then minus uh, g m minus 1, and this will be minus g m plus 1. And since we are trying to find out the eigenvalue of this matrix, so that would be nothing but this eigenvalue equation, right? AX is equal to lambda x, right? That's what we are written here. So that's what we are written. AX is equal to lambda x, and then we wrote any one of the line. That would be this. Now if you understand, the diagonal is m, so we have a super diagonal plus 1, sub diagonal plus 1, and the diagonal itself is minus 2. And because we have on the right hand side minus lambda into gm, so we put it on this side, so we get this, right? We have a periodic problem, right? That's how we say. So if I'm, uh, uh, well, the Dirichlet condition problem. So what I could do is I could uh, write down any arbitrary uh, solution in terms of a complete set. And let that complete set be the Fourier set. So if I do that, I can take uh, this as the basis function, right? Sign of this. So <coughs> I am actually uh, looking at the, the number of uh, points in the n direction is given by capital M. So that's how I'm doing. I'm dividing pi by a plus 1. And then this two uh, uh, indices m and k will identify the modes, right? So we are looking at the mth row. So that's why the end is there. And k is the one that we can, even for that single row, I can have all possible eigenvalue combinations for k ranging from 1 to m. OK. Now, uh, 
you can uh, substitute this and work out, you will find the eigenvalue of it. Exactly like almost uh, similar to what we have done here. You write down, uh, substitute there and 55, you find out that the eigenvalues are this, or this equation, right? Uh, and the eigenvectors, of course, this is the chosen eigenvector that we have. So we find out, look at uh, uh, this equation, and uh, u is equal to fl. That had the 1 over hl square outside. Uh, so that's why the eigenvalues of that ln matrix is given by minus 4 by h square. If the sine square uh, find mu hl by 2. Now, if I um, think of very simple, let's say, Jacobi type of iteration, then uh, I, I, what I do usually is I write down the L operator in terms of the, the diagonal part and anything that is other than the diagonal entry is written here G of that. Okay. So if I uh, substitute this into LL UL equal to FL, this is what you get. Right? So in the actual iterative sequence, what we do is basically uh, we put the left hand side of the new level, right? J plus one is level of iteration. And this uh, right hand side, we keep it at the previous level, J. And then uh, the Jacobi operation would imply that I take the simply D inverse, right? The diagonal entry. That's what we have done also some uh, model example of three by three matrix because that's the way we do. So the Jacobi iteration would be nothing but uh, taking the diagonal part out and using that uh, to define the end matrix we talked about. So you actually write it down to so BL inverse. And BL itself is nothing but minus of LL into LL minus GL. So if I uh, carry out this operation, GL inverse inside, I will see that this is the way actually point the good iteration work, that whatever we have at the new iteration level is nothing but uh, the old iteration level value minus BL inverse. So this is your N inverse into the uh, defect. This quantity we call it as defect. Uh, we have also defined something called residue, which is nothing but minus of defect. So it's all that. So basically, what we are seeing that at every level we uh, end up uh, obtaining a correction. Correction is u j plus one minus u j, and that is driven by the defect and uh, driven by the choice of the matrix. That's how we do. This is uh, something well known to us. So, but we uh, also have seen that sometimes we could actually uh, increase uh, the convergence rate by under relaxation, uh, introducing this factor capital theta here. And since it's under relaxation, we keep it between 0 and 1, right? That's our definition of under relaxation of uh, uh, this class of methods. And, uh, for um, the problem that we have chosen, D inverse is nothing but HL square by 2 into I matrix, right? That's what we do, because the diagonal entry is minus 2, right? So if I take D inverse, that will be uh, minus 2 by HL square already is there, so, so that goes in the numerator, so I get D inverse at HL square by 2 into I matrix. And uh, so, this has a half factor here, so theta by 2 if I define as omega, so I will write down this uh, uh, under relaxed uh, Jacobi method as uh, the new iterate is equal to the old iterate minus uh, omega i to square into this uh, okay. okay. So that could be uh, written down in this particular <coughs> case, right? ML uh, times the uh, old matrix. So, ML is nothing but our uh, iterative uh, the amplification matrix that we have already defined. Okay. So how well this method is going to converge will depend upon will depend upon the eigen spectrum of this uh, M matrix. And M matrix is given by I minus uh, this. So we have already found out the eigenvalue of L M matrix, so it is not at all difficult to find out the M matrix. That would be nothing but 
uh, 1 coming from the I matrix minus this quantity omega i to the square and uh, the lambda of the other matrix, which itself is uh, 4 by i to the square times the final matrix of the group. So basically, uh, what we are finding, the eigenvalues are given in terms of this. And this we have uh, often commented that we choose uh, uh, theta, capital theta, or in this case uh, omega, so that to hasten our convergence. And so if I choose, let's say, theta is equal to half. Uh, so theta equal to half will give me uh, omega as one fourth, right? And uh, if I take theta equal to one, means no relaxation at all, that will give me omega equal to half, right? Because that is theta by two, right? So what happens if the eigenvalue of the matrix, the spectral radius, as we call them by rho, so rho for uh, theta equal to half will be nothing but maximum of this sequence, one minus sine square pi mu h l by two. So what is the maximum? The maximum will be when this is uh, going to be the least, right? Sine square part will be least. That will correspond to mu equal to one. So we get this one minus sine square pi h l by two. And if h l is small, I could see that uh, this is the spectral radius, right? So this is what we have uh, commented upon earlier also that the underlying act uh, Jacobi method actually um, the spectral radius uh, varies with h l square. So uh, what does it mean? Like it means that uh, you can solve the problem with a coarser grain, right? The moment you go over to a finer grade, what happens? h l comes down and your row comes closer to 1. That means your error reduction ability comes down, right? So if you work on a finer grade, you'll find it much more tougher to convert. So this so happens uh, that people have historically found out initially, you know, with the limited computing ability, we used to take 20, 30 points and show some good results. The moment you have a better computer, is instead of taking 20, 30 points, you take 200, 300 points, and immediately you see that the convergence history has uh, become very worse. So that uh, comes out from this observation, you can see, because the spectral radius is uh, directly proportional to h l square, and if h l uh, becomes smaller, so h l square becomes even smaller, so your spectral radius is very close to 1, and you don't uh, get uh, any benefit even for this modern simple equation that you have. Um, whereas if you look at uh, the case where you don't have any under relaxation, it is 1 minus 2 sine square pi h l So, if I, um, instead of uh, reading all that, let's go over to this next page and then we'll see what we are talking about. Like uh, when we take theta equal to half, omega equal to one fourth, my eigenvalues are given like this, right? I could uh, plot on this axis mu times hl. So if mu times hl is zero, so then uh, I'll have a maximum case, right? Sine square zero. So, so I will have the eigenvalue as one. But as uh, the eigenvalue number index increases, it keeps on uh, changing it by its value. And we have seen it's 1 minus sine square mu pi, uh, pi hl by 2. So when I'm going to 1 here, mu hl equal to 1, so that will be pi by 2. So 1 minus 1 will be 0. So what happens that uh, that may show here that if I am working on this particular uh, level of grade, then the different uh, eigenvalues uh, di corresponding to the error behave differently because of the associated eigenvalues that I see here. The ones, those which are small, they do not change very much. Whereas the eigenvalues which are to the right extreme they, they are going to be damped very, very strongly because they're coming close to zero, right? So what happens is I could uh, mark out a space where I say, okay, this part, the shaded part, is the area where uh, 
I get a very strong damping starting from half to zero. So every time I do that, my error gets magnified by this eigenvalue, right? So this part struggles. It does not change very much, but this part attenuates at a quite uh, rapid rate. Okay. What does uh, the large value of mu HL imply in terms of wavelength? These are very, very small wavelengths. So what happens is, whenever we do this classical iteration, in the initial few steps, we keep on removing this uh, small scale error very happily because of this nature. However, if you look at the case where you actually did not do any under relaxation, that corresponding lambda would be this, given by this red line. Why? It is 1 minus 2 sine square pi mu HL by 2, right? So what will be the range? It will go from plus 1 to minus 1. And that's what you have seen. So if you don't under relax, then what you have seen <coughs> that it's only some intermediate stage where error is reduced. Even this size, you know, the error would not be reduced. Why? Because it is close to minus 1. See, your ability to reduce error will depend on how far away you are from 1, close to 0 in magnitude. So what happens is that this is a funny case that you uh, are not under relaxing. So in the process what we do, in the process what we do is, uh, we can control errors which have large wavelength, size of the domain, given by this side, right? At the same time, we are not able to control the errors which are the smallest. Which are the smallest for a given uh, domain and a given grid? It will depend on the grid spacing, right? We have already talked about Nyquist's limit, so we know that the moment I choose HL, which is the maximum grid number that I can control is given by the Nyquist limit. So if I don't do this uh, under relaxation, I end up reducing error in the middle by high wave number and low wave number error remain uh, sort of recalcitrant. They just re refuse to change. Okay? And whether you are under relaxing or not, in both the cases you see what is the troublesome area. Troublesome area is this end. This end corresponds to the largest wavelength of the problem that you have. Right? The domain size. That's, that's what this corresponds to. So, that variation, so if I talk about my domain by this horizontal line, those ones, those eigenvalues there, corresponds to, I have shown you my three possibilities. The black line corresponds to the largest wavelength that you can handle with the grid. That is half the wavelength, right? Half the wavelength. The next one, of course, is the red one. That uh, is the next harmonic that uh, spans the whole domain by a single wave, right? And the blue line is something like a subharmonic, right? It's three by two. But I could also have drawn uh, the second harmonic and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at uh, the error components drawn as we have done here, now what we are seeing that uh, in this part, you know, this black error, which is uh, positive, could be ca cancelled by this red component, right? But that is not so in this range. See, the region I have shown, region 1, to the left of the vertical line, is where all these error com components are conspiring together to add. Right? They are all adding up. So it's a very, very interesting situation that why we don't want to do this kind of uh, normal mode analysis and feel good that, okay, I am taking care of uh, one harmonic at a time. But that's not the way the error behaves. Error appears together. So if I would have taken any arbitrary error, after a few levels of iteration, what I find that in this region, in this part, all of them add up. 
So I got a kind of error picking up in this region. In the other part, it has some mutual cancellations and it does that. So even though we are talking about a linear problem, even though we are talking about a linear problem, where I would legitimately demand that I could superpose the solution. But unfortunately, the error shows that its distribution, spatial distribution changes because of this kind of a property. Okay? So error reinforcement in region 1 is very, very much of a possibility. So, what we uh, then find is that we can draw these conclusions that we have written that uh, compared to omega equal to one fourth, omega equal to half has a better convergence. Why did I say that? Well, go back to the figure. What is the most difficult thing to control? <coughs> the most difficult thing to control is in this region. Right? And in this region you can see that red is better than black. Isn't it? Uh, so red is red is what? That is without any under relaxation. So that's what we say that when we look at the convergence history, we might see the solution without any uh, under relaxation uh, would do better than the one done with this. Whereas we have also noticed that with the under relaxation, what we are able to do? We could remove the error component which was at the highest wave number range. Right? So, what happens is, this is the crux of the second point, that for new HL greater than equal to half, the error is very effectively done for the under relaxation case. Okay? So, that's what uh, brings us to the dilemma, you know, I mean, we cannot afford to stay in one grade and then keep on uh, working with different theta. That's what it means. See, the difference between these two tells us about how different theta does. And that is exactly what we are doing in ADL. In ADL, we are not keeping a fixed theta. We are, those, those are those acceleration parameters. We kept on changing them and we are trying to see what happens. And this is what I always, as I jokingly say, it's a poor man's blanket. I mean, you try to control the error in the high wave number, the low wave number is not controlled. And if you try to control the low wave number, you can't do it. If you decide to stay in the same way. Now, uh, this is uh, what we learn then, that the smaller wavelength, that is high wave number component error reduces by at least half but longer wavelengths are very slow in converging. And this is a practical experience. If you go ahead and try to solve the elliptic equation, you will always come back after some attempt and say, look, initially things look very good, then are reduced, but then after some time it has stopped uh, changing at all. And that is the story that's what we narrated here. So basically the error, the iteration and improvement that we have given by the last equation is uh, is actually dictated upon by this defect term. And now, so what we can do? What we can do is, uh, instead we decide to work on multiple grades. So uh, let me try to explain the whole thing uh, with the help of only two grades. So one grade, let's say, has a spacing HL that I call as the fine grade. And, uh, another grade which will be twice the spacing. So that will be a coarser grade, I'll call it as H L minus 1. So the way that uh, we would be working on would be we start with some kind of a old guess that we are uh, calling as U of uh, superscript old. Then what we will do, we will uh, do some small number of iterations in the finest grade itself, uh, at H, H L level itself. What will happen? That we have seen that we could, if we do under relaxation, then we can remove those high wave number component. What does the high wave number component do? So if I have a uh, solution,
I, if, if you look at the low wave number component, it goes like this. Right? The high wave number components will be riding on it, and if they are smaller than this, then you are going to get something like this. Right? So this is, let's say, the total error to be given by this jagged line. So that jagged line implies that you have low wave number as well as high wave number component. Now, the moment, um, if you recall what we did uh, here, the moment we did few iterations in that grid, we are removing this part of the error. So what will happen? This will actually, after a few levels of uh, solution at HL, this uh, variation, this high grid number variation will go away, and I will get a rather a kind of a solution like this. So this, I could call it by you old and this is what let me call it as the box. So this is at the LF level, so this is what we have uh, down here that uh, we uh, start off with some initial guess, uh, perform uh, some small number of iterations at HA level and then we get a smoother solution, right? So now you can understand this evil bar that we have obtained. It has smeared out on those high wave number variations, right? So, what happens is, if I know uh, what we are trying to solve, we are trying to solve is L of QM. Yeah, this is also grid dependent. The operator also dependent on it. So that's what we are trying to do. So it's not an exact solution. Uh, we will be able to write it as so that's what uh, we have. So the exact solution is uh, there uh, in this fashion. And then what I could do is I could construct a departure vector or error. I call it as VL. VL is nothing but uh, the smoothed out solution minus the original solution. So what happens is if I uh, have uh, done that operation, then this VL is a lot more smoother than what we had begun. Because now having done all this iterative uh, method, we have removed the higher frequency so it becomes smooth. That's the whole purpose. Now, having obtained um, UL bar, I can calculate the defect. Because if you recall, the defect is what drives the solution. That's what we wrote in the last Term, right? The defect term actually drives the solution. So what happens is we calculate the defect and then we try to solve for the new unknown VL in that let's say the finest grid itself. And this is like this. So VL itself is UL bar minus UL. So that is nothing but the defect. So what happens is now we need to solve actually this equation for VL. Uh, with uh, a defect which is a lot more smoother than what we had corresponding to v one. Now, if it is already smooth and we are already in the fine grid, doing anything more is not going to help me. What I could do actually, instead now I could go over to a coarser grid. See, basically this kind of smoothing at this scale if I look at this scale, this scale corresponds to what? HL. See, this is this this corresponds to that figure we showed on the right extreme points. Those are the maximum uh, wave numbers which we could handle given this uh, grid size. So that's what we are suggesting now. That look, we have exhausted all the possibility whatever we could in the HL grid. So now let's do that. Instead of solving LB equal to B in the L grade, we go over to a coarser grade. So what happens is now, I will try to reduce error in what? In this range, where 
the grid spacing is two times HF, right? That's our portion grid definition. So what happens is, having exhausted those errors at the smallest possible uh, level to the finest grid, we <coughs> migrate to the next uh, portion level grid. And that is what is given here. Now, uh, how do we solve this equation? Uh, solving this equation uh, requires the knowledge of this defect and the force and grade. Now, uh, what we do is we define the defect in the force and grade is equal to R times D. Uh, what is R? R is some kind of the operator. So I have uh, the defect in the fine grid dm. I could have just, because the points are common, right? Between the fine grid and the coarse grid, when, from the perspective of the coarser grid, the points are common with the fine grid, then I could just simply pick it up. If I do that, that is what in mathematical jargon is called trivial injection. I just simply take it and put it. See, when things are very simple, we try to confound everyone around by jargon. So this is mathematical version. Okay. They will say, do not use trivial injection. Uh, I'll tell you why. But instead they say that you do this. Instead what you do is whatever may be the error that you have obtained in the fine grain, you take a combination of that at say x location by picking up the value there, add up its two neighbors and uh, scale it so that you get equal to one. And you know what has happened. Well, I think uh, we will uh, discuss it tomorrow and then we will see what actually we did. <laughs>